Hello, Greg. Hello, Luke. Thank you for coming. Okay, so uh, today I want to interview you about your book, uh, Son of God. Okay. About a conscious son. Last time you were on, uh, last time I interviewed you, it was about the state is out of date, which was a fantastic book about, about well, uh, how we don't need a government. Something. It's about how we could actually do a much better job ourselves and making, making the case on how we could do that rather than having a, a bunch of sort of not very respectable people, not very intelligent people, having the power to tell us what to do and investing billions in silly schemes and thinking they know more about our health and welfare than we do. And it's, it's things that we're naturally good at doing and those skills have been taken away from us in a sense. So we think, oh, how could we do that? But we could. But that's another subject. <laughs> so today I want to uh, interview you about your book, and your book is about uh, the conscious son. Correct. And uh, so, so before we kind of get anywhere with this, I, I'd like to understand what you mean by conscious. You know, what kind of definition are we working with when we say the son is conscious? What, what does that mean? It means self-aware, basically, with knowing what you're doing. Um, it's the most basic definition of consciousness and there are actually two mathematicians in Princeton University in America who've actually made a mathematical proof. Um, we could segue this into consciousness about free will because obviously if you, if you have free will you have consciousness and they've said that if human beings have free will so do subatomic particles. And if subatomic particles don't have free will, then neither do human beings. And that's pretty extreme. Um, but they are actually extending it to subatomic particles. But I have had conversations with physicists who believe firmly that everything that we do, including if I you know, stick this finger in my ear and go like that, was predetermined by the arrangement of particles at the Big Bang. So there would be no free will in that case? There's no free will. That this is all predetermined somehow at the Big Bang. Um, but if we do have free will, then a lot of other things do. I'm only really, well, the, I began the book just extending that to the sun. I found out about this Princeton, Prince, Princeton principle after I wrote the book. Um, but, yeah. I mean, the mainstream would strongly disagree with that concept, I think, right? Yeah. The idea, uh, you know, I can, I can choose what to say to you, I can choose to come here and interview you today. Can a subatomic particle choose to do what it does? I mean, you know. Well, quantum theory, you, you, it's, you can't predict what a particle is going to do. You can predict what it's likely to do and the odds on it, but you don't really know what they're going to do, which hole the photon's going to go through. And this is, this is one of the great mysteries of quantum theory, that, uh, as Carl Sagan said, anybody who says they understand it hasn't studied it <laughs> deeply enough. So, so then, are you saying that, um, that everything from humans to the subatomic particle and everything in between is conscious, or just the subatomic particle and just humans? No, no, I'm suggesting that the entire universe is infused with consciousness. So and this idea that that we are the only vehicle through which consciousness can manifest sometime after we dropped out of the trees or came out of the trees and um, started to remember things and say, oh, I'm a human being. Oh my God, that, that's when we acquire this unique thing called consciousness. And the standard scientific point, I mean, it's starting to weaken now, but from Descartes onwards, is that dogs and cats are not aware of their own existence. Even though dogs sniff around trees and lampposts, seeing what other dogs have been there, and you know, as, as, a, as a dog-loving friend of mine said, that's their newspaper. Why are we stopping at every lamppost for your dog? That's their newspaper, mate. Um, I mean, Descartes famously or infamously nailed his own dog to a table and dissected it live, saying, oh, the yelps and screams, they're just the, like a machine that hasn't been oiled that's squeaking. It doesn't feel pain. And it's, it's, it's a horrendous concept. And well, it, it, it seems that that's changing a little bit. I think when oh, yeah. I was young, it was quite normal for people to think that dogs, you know, were just kind of automa automatons, kind of like robots. Yeah. But, but I'd say that's changed a bit. But well, now they're, they're, they're accepting dolphins, higher apes, 
uh, whales. There's a few things that, and they got these silly rules like if you can see yourself in a mirror, or recognize yourself in a mirror. Um, but you know, when I used to be a fisherman, I I dig for worms, and you grab a worm, and it use the air all its energy to get back in the ground before you can pull it out, and it often does because it wants to stay alive. Um, if that's not self-awareness, uh, what is? I mean, I suppose that could be an automatic process. I, I, I mean, you know, the, 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 we have innate processes in us, the, 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 the need to mate, the need to eat, the need to poop, you know, all of those things. Um, uh, are well, they necessarily conscious acts? Well, I don't know. There's no way to really... Uh, it probably is a way to data check it out, but uh, I would suggest that, that that worm has a little sigh of relief relation when it does <laughs> get, get, get out. You know. um, but that's a separate, a separate matter. Well, so we have, we have this kind of, we've begun to accept that living systems are conscious, you know, to mm -hmm. some degree, uh, whether it's a dog or a dolphin or, or, or a pig or, a, you know, an insect or whatever. But, but um, the idea that non-living systems are conscious is, I, I think, probably still a step too far for most people. Well, this is, this is again, it's, it's a very new, difficult concept to understand, but it's an ancient concept. And it goes way, way back, way before Descartes, way before Christianity, the Abrahamic religions that, that really said we have reign over everything else on the earth and the only conscious things in existence are human beings, God, and the angels, and, and the devil, and everything else is unconscious. Now, scientists sort of took that on and they excluded God, devils, and angels and just said, only we are conscious. But before then, people had an appreciation that trees were conscious, that rivers had consciousness, and they respected them, and they, inter, inter, they communicated with them, if you like. And they built great monuments to the stars and the sun um, that I see as the information technology of the day, not just elaborate burial chambers. We still haven't figured out quite what they did with, with that structure, but it's a hell of an undertaking to, to, to make um, if there's no payoff at the end. Unless it was like the HS2 of the, <laughs> of the day spending 100 billion on it. So, so, I mean, of course these ancient cultures uh, believed in a conscious world, they had a kind of animist, animistic perspective on reality. Yeah. Um, but you know, that's not normal in today's world. So, so why do you think the sun is conscious? You know, what, what led you to believe that the sun could be conscious? Well, it's not a normal way of thinking. Well, first of all, it, just, it is a normal way of thinking. I mean, it was for thousands of years before the Abrahamic religions and Descartes came along and told us, this is nonsense, you have to forget about this, and started burning people who felt that way. But it was the default mode. So what Connect, reconnected me with the default mode was my first LSD trip in 1966 in Berkeley, California, where I climbed to the top of this Strawberry Canyon, looked over the San Francisco Bay, and looked up at the sun, and started staring into it. And I did that for about 20 minutes. I know you're not supposed to stare into the sun, but uh, I was recognized, I could, there was no squinting, it was easy, it wasn't hurting my eyes, and that's when I realized there's somebody staring back, if you like, you know, it's not a, it's not a completely one-way process. And that's just something I held with me as a special little understanding for the rest of my, you know, the next 30 years. And it wasn't until 2000 that I decided, let me just write a book on this and explore this subject, you know, a bit more. Because just say the sun is conscious, end of story, you know, people just think you're nuts. Um, but as I started to explore it, everything I turned up scientifically or historically made more sense of it. And it just, if you were coming at it from a completely unbiased mind, nobody had ever told you that human beings are the only conscious thing in the entire universe um, and that you have to have this particular wiring of neurons that we've got in order to have this consciousness which is the greatest mystery of our existence. That's not me saying that, that's 
any, any scientist or philosopher, even though it's consciousness trying to understand consciousness, we have no idea what it is. It's a, but it is an energy field. It's not a completely physical matter thing. And to the end, and the sun is itself a complete energy field. So if you're looking at it impartially, and you find out, first of all, it's, a, it's the light of life for everything. I mean, we're, we're recycled sunlight. That's the energy of life. It's stored in plants or animals that eat the plants. We take that in, we recycle it as, as human beings. It's the light of life coming out of our lives. And it's the light of life for every plant, tree, flower there around. Um, so just, that's not an argument, but you know, maybe that thing which makes life available for everything else knows life itself. So, but, so but also it's the behavior of stars. Um, if you, if you, from the scientific viewpoint, they're just accidental phenomena, completely haphazard, that happen to bring us the light of life. But then you look at other things they happen to do. They live as couples. You know, they always pair up and they sort of, most systems are binary and they travel through their galaxy as, as a couple, sometimes like a pair of figure skaters, it's been said. Um, okay, that could be accidental. They live in communities of millions of stars. They don't, they're not randomly scattered about, but they live in stellar communities. That could be random. That could be accidental, maybe. Um, they're formed out of clouds of hydrogen. Hydrogen and helium gas somehow coalesce it's accidentally into a star. Um, we'll come back to that. And between, we're only aware of this between the sun and earth. Um, it, I suspect it's this case with all the other planets. But NASA discovered this about six months after I, after I finished writing my book, Son of God, um, and which is the magnetic portal that connects the sun to Earth. And they said they would have never believed it, but they've got four satellites that are clocking it. And it's a magnetic portal or field that comes off of Earth. It's the diameter of Earth comes off of the sun's corona, where it's diameter of Earth as well, I guess. And every eight minutes, they join together. And when they join together, tons of high energy particles pass back and forth between the sun and Earth. Does it do this with other planets too, or just the Earth? Well, we haven't got, the, it's an invisible portal, so we haven't got the technology to find that out. We haven't got, you know, a dozen satellites surrounding other planets to, to check these things out. I suspect it is. They have detected the similar portals connecting galaxy to galaxy um, outside of the Milky Way. And it just... This is all new no, to me. I don't, I don't, I can't say that one's accidental. Yeah, right, that, that, um, sounds, that sounds like something's going on there. And you have the solar wind, it's called. It's a stream of charged particles which come off of the sun because the sun spins and they come off and it's a, just a spiraling action but it encases our entire solar system in the heliosphere, which is a, it's a protective um, umbrella, protective case around our solar system so that when high energy cosmic rays come in from outer space, um, the ones that can sort of damage the surface of the planets and eat our atmospheres up and so forth, we're protected by the sun. The sun actually protects us from galactic rays from space. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, and, and we're all in this little bubble traveling through the galaxy. Um, you know, if you're completely impartial, you, you, know, you think there's some consciousness going on there at a very high level. Um, well, let's say there is. What, why is recognizing that consciousness important? You know, what, what, why bother? Look, it's, it's the sun, it's, it's the star in the movie of life. It's the most important thing in all of our lives. There would be, there would be no space for us to exist in, there'd be, well, without the sun and other stars, there would be no matter to make stuff with. Whether it's your cameras or the flowers or water or our bodies or our bones. Because um, the, the universe started off as hydrogen and helium. 
which we can make lighter than air balloons out of those, but not a lot else. The stars take those two elements and have turned them into everything from oxygen and carbon to gold during a supernova explosion. They're all created by in, through the lifetimes and death of stars. Um, and the energy of life is sunlight. And not recognizing that is it's just a huge gap in our spiritual consciousness. Well, well let's say we do start recognizing the sun as conscious, then, you, okay, you say it has a relationship stars, with planets. Stars okay. in general, yeah. Stars in general. So our particular sun has a relationship with Earth in terms of this magnetic uh, portal information passing or, or something. No, that's part um, of the relationship, yeah. So, so, okay, the sun has a relationship with the Earth. Can we have a relationship with the sun? Uh, is that what you're advocating here? Uh, yeah, I mean, we all do, but... Well, I guess people don't recognize that relationship. I do, and I think it's, uh, it's unbelievable that people spend more time in their lives deciding what sunglasses to wear and you know, putting sunblock on themselves than they do thinking about the star in our movie. And it's, I think it's no, no accident that we call celebrities stars because stars are the celebrities of, of the galaxy and people used to worship them and recognize them and, and get the energy from them on a dark night, which we don't get many anymore, you know, no light pollution. People used to look up at the stars and actually get information from that light coming into their eyes. Like we can, uh, with a spectrometer and a, and a telescope, we can see what element stars are made up of. And we can sort of detect physical things from them, but ancient people used to get vibrations from those stars, because you're actually getting the light from the star in the back of your eyeballs. So if you have developed that ability to process that and see what it's like, you can get the character of the star from that. Just like when you look at the lights coming out of somebody's eyes, in, in our own experience, you can sometimes tell that guy really hates me, or she's in love with me, or they're bored as fuck. You know, to, and people would look at the stars and they would get similar information, which is why well, with, with the planets, everywhere you went in the world, people knew Jupiter was the king of the planets. And yet when you look at the sky, Venus is usually bigger than Jupiter. How did they know? Something in the light was telling them. And this was also the basis, I believe, of astrology, which, which long predated astronomy. Astronomy was just, okay, let's look at the mechanics of these things that are affecting us. But it's... Uh, I mean, this whole, this whole having a relationship with the stars and getting information from them, though, is, is a, a, a lost science, I suppose. I mean, certainly now, if you say to someone in the street, oh, you know, I talk to the sun, or, you know, I have some relationship with the sun, they'll probably think you're a bit crazy. It's not really accepted in our cultural, you know, no. system. But, um, so I gather you practice sun gazing. How does that, uh, how, you know, that also sounds absolutely crazy um, and dangerous, uh, you know. To it's not. Um, William Turner used to um, sun gaze. And it's, he would stare at the sun for long periods of time. He was known as the painter of light. And somebody was telling him, oh, you're going to hurt your eyes like that. He said, no, for me, gazing at the sun is like for you looking at a candle. And it is something that you can adjust to with, with, with practice. And I, I did, never did it from that first experience in Berkeley. I didn't know about sun gazing then. And you know, I, I actually didn't become part of my life for many years after that. And it was, uh, there, there was a um, HRM, I think is the man's, he goes by his initials an Indian sage who goes out and talks about sun gazing and nothing else. He doesn't think anything about the sun other than what sun gazing is good for and how to do it. But you've seen sunsets where when the sun's just, you know, this far over the horizon, you can, you can stare at this beautiful orange, red, yellow globe. I'm, I'm afraid to, though. I'm afraid that it'll damage my eyes. That's what I've been taught since I was young. Oh, well, not, not when it's just come up or when it's just going down. And if it is going to damage your eyes, 
um, you're going to be squinting when you do it. It's not like, and also if you look at the actual records on it, you'll find that most people who even they've been blinded for you know, two days by looking at the sun and they fully recover. But it's not something that you should do. But when it's going down and, and after it's gone up is a completely safe time for beginners. And I sun gaze quite often on a reflection off the water or off, some, off a window or if it's going through thin light trees. And why do this? What do you get from sun gazing? Why, why would you do this? I just uh, connect with my divine star, if you like, and I get energized by it. Uh, it's a type of meditation, if you like, but it's, it's, it's a powerful, um, it's inspirational at times as well. So, so, I mean, you're advocating having some kind of direct communion relationship with the sun here. So, so it seems like, so, so, well, if you do, well, what kind of feedback can people expect? I mean, and what kind of relationships can you develop? Sun gazing is one, what else can you do? And then what, what do you get back from it when you do it? It's, uh, if you'd never had parents, you know, you might have, have how, how would you describe to somebody what the effect is of loving your parents and interacting with them and just sharing your life with them? Um, if you'd never even knew that there was such a thing as parents, you were brought up in a baby farm somewhere, <laughs> processed out, you wouldn't understand any of that. Um, it just lightens up my life uh, to have this relationship. So, so how can someone who's, you know, we're, all of society is the equivalent of a baby farm in that respect, how do we build that relationship? What do we do? Do we just say, hello, son? You know, is that it? What, what, what do we do? Just, just recognize that it's not an accidental ball of life. It's not an accidental ball of light in the sky that happens to bring us life. This is, this is our you know, father and mother and on all sorts of spiritual levels. And it's, it's no surprise that the Christians burned people for centuries because they held this belief, because it completely undermines the whole God made everything in the universe for us. And he put stars in the sky so we could know when to plant our crops. And he put the sun up there to bring us light by the day and this idea that God created the sun for us. And I mean, we have this really warped view. And even though people might not go to church anymore and say, I'm not a Christian, I'm a pagan, they still tend to um, to feel that we're the only living thing and everything put on this planet here is just for us and we're not part of the wholeness. And for me, the, the actual living sun part of the book is just one chapter. And the rest of the book after that is mainly the, the inevitable implications of that. I mean, if the sun and stars are conscious entities, celestial beings, then many other things fall into place and, and can't really be avoided, and that, that including the nature of light itself. I'd like to get into that, but, but before we do, um, you know, one, one thing in our culture is that we're taught to kind of shut ourselves off from the sun. This may come from this kind of ancient Christian idea. That, yeah, be frightened of the sun. But, um, you know, people I mean, we all need the sun. It, it, there's tons of studies showing how good it is for you. Yeah. It can help your eyesight, uh, uh, you know, the depression, cancer, rickets, arthritis, the whole list of things. The yeah. vitamin D you need from the sun. Certainly we need it. Uh, and yet we're taught to shut ourselves off from it as much as possible, to not let it touch us because otherwise, you know, we'll get cancer from it. Um, and so I take it you don't advocate using sunscreen? Um, I certainly don't. <laughs> never touched me. Um, I put sunscreen on my tattooed watch. Okay. <laughs> just, just kind of. I don't want to fade the now message. That's the time. Um, and I have some, you know, organic natural sunscreen just for that purpose. But uh, aside from finding that it's 16 of the 21 allowed active ingredients in sunscreen, this is just very recently. They've come out and said, 
they're all dubious. They all could be harmful, and they're not quite sure why they're approved. Um, zinc oxide and titanium are two of the ones that do work and aren't, aren't damaging. Um, but they've also done studies, Sweden and America, uh, on the benefits, you know, scientific studies, and one in Sweden was 20 years, with 19,528 women. Um, they charted them, and the ones who, there was ones who avoided the sun, and ones who got as much sun as they could. And the ones who got as much sun as they could, well, so the ones who avoided the sun, twice as many of them died during the 20 year period as the ones who took the sunshine. And then they found out all these other diseases, degenerative diseases, that were markedly less active in people who took the sunshine in. Um, and the whole sort of skin cancer is not a red herring. People do get skin cancer. And if you've got red hair and, you know, bright white skin, you're not going to be able to take as much sun as I can. But when you, when you get your sun in small doses and build up a tan, that's you, your actual body has got the melanin in it which with, with the tan, and then it's benefiting from the sunshine and taking it in. There's no damage, but you have to have that. And once you've got a sun tan, you're able to go out in the sun, and, and it's really good for you. It's so... Uh, when you sunburn, that is the cause of skin cancer, is getting too much sunburn. And that should really be avoided. So... Also, I saw a study about how um, the, the, the metals in sunscreen are showing up in coastal waters around, and, and you know, uh, they're, oh, they're yeah. le leaching into the water and polluting the water. Yeah, no, it's, it's toxic stuff. It's just one of the many toxic things that we just flush into the environment because it's all dead and nothing else is alive. So why should we pay attention to it? So, so rather than shutting ourselves off from the sun, let's say we want to have a relationship with the sun, for, you know, before doing that, I guess it's worth talking, what, what kind of consciousness does the sun have? Um, you know, is it like a human kind of consciousness? Is it, is it like, I mean, you know, it's very difficult to kind of understand it what that consciousness yeah. is like. Um, but if you were to ask the same question um, to one of those sort of probiotic bacteria in our gut, we've got as many of, as much weight of those as we have, you know, brain, um, and you ask that bacteria, what's it like? What do you think the human consciousness is like? What do they think about, you know, what's going on up there? You know, I don't think it knows. I mean, it might know that we like sugar and, and say, oh, give me more sugar, you know, and control our taste like that. Um, but it's, uh, it's, it's a difficult question because you've got, you know, I mean, again, you look at the, the galaxy, there's more or less roughly the same amount of stars in the Milky Way as there are neurons in our brain. And they might all be hooked up as well. And you might then ask an individual star, what's the galaxy thinking about? Fuck no. <laughs> well, when we talk about things being conscious, you know, if we talk about a dolphin or a dog or whatever, mm -hmm. we, we tend to have that, we, we tend to understand that to mean that it's got some sort of um, self-determination, it can mm -hmm. take autonomous decisions and do, do what it wants to do. Um, you were talking before about the sun traveling through space. Uh, Remember, I, was, uh, I interviewed this guy, Nassim Haramein, I don't know if you know him. Yeah, yeah. And he was talking about how we, we have a model of the solar system as a kind of 2D thing, you know, these circles. Yeah, it's, it's a spiraling through. It's actually through a spiraling fact, yeah, through yeah, space. Yeah. It's, it's, a, it's a 3D thing. So, does the sun appear to have, in your opinion, a kind of autonomous decision-making in terms of what it does and where it goes and, you know, in the, in the terms that we understand? Or, or? Well, it would seem that way because according to the laws of physics, if, stump, if stars are just dumb, dead balls of matter responding to the laws of physics, galaxy would, galaxies would fall apart. They'd, they'd, fly, they'd fly off of the, in, into the galaxies. And stars at the edge of the galaxies wouldn't be traveling the same speed as stars at the center of the galaxy. And yet, they're not behaving according to the laws of physics. And this is why we have what 
I think is the luminiferous ether of the modern age. I don't know if you know the luminiferous ether. That was what was a scientific concept that held for a couple of centuries, and, and they, they kept looking for the luminiferous ether, um, which is the the field that carried sound and light and energy. Um, and then finally, they realized there was none, and. Um, Einstein was the one who finally killed, put that to the, to the, in the cabin or way. But uh, today we have dark matter. And it's just, they have no idea why stars are behaving like this. So they've created... When you say like this, what do you mean? Do, well, the, 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 the not, not following the laws of physics. In which way are they not following the laws of physics? So um, this is new to me. They're, they're, they're traveling at similar speeds at the edge of the galaxy and at the center of the galaxy, and if they're all sort of going around this dark hole, this black hole at the center of it, they wouldn't be behaving like that. And so there's this ludicrous construct, dark matter, that nothing can detect it, and they're spending, you know, because we, one, one, one advantage of recognizing stellar consciousness is we could save all the billions of, you know, they're spending at the, CERN, you know, underground at CERN to try and detect, all over the world they're, they're spending billions trying to detect dark matter, as they did the luminiferous ether in the 19th and 18th centuries. And um, once you recognize the stars are conscious, then the reason galaxies don't fall apart is because they're not stupid, because they're, they're living beings. And there's in fact, a, at last there's a physicist in America, Gregory Matloff, who has recognizes as well that stars are volitional beings. Now, as a scientist, he can see that, but he's trying to find out how they move. Once he knows how they're able to move through space of their own choice, then that's the proof of his theory. But is the current theory what it is? Just gravity moving them around? Or what, what is it? No, dark matter is the fix-all. We have no idea what dark matter is, what the density, where it is, or what, but somehow it's just, that's the answer, dark matter, you know. Uh, and it's, it's, it's like they've given a, a, an answer to the solution of a problem when they have no idea what the actual answer is, but they've given it a name. If they called it factor X, I'd be quite happy with it. I wouldn't ridicule it, but dark matter implies that it's something we just haven't discovered because it's got to have gravitational pull, so it has to be matter. And it's, it's 70 or 80 percent of the matter in the universe is, is not there. It's just it's a silly fantasy. So, so you seem to be suggesting that the whole universe itself is actually conscious. Yeah. And though you focused your book on the sun, well, first of all, why did you focus the book on the, the sun? Just uh, well, no, that's that that was my that's all I had. Okay. That was my starting that point. That was your beginning. Okay. I was actually writing another book on something else. It was going to be a second book. And after a few pages, I started to talk about people recognizing the sun as a conscious being in the past. And I suddenly kept on that. And I'm, actually, this is going to be the book. So, so, okay, let's say the whole universe is conscious and alive with consciousness and thinking. Uh -huh. or, or thinking? I don't know if is that even the right word. Um, like, is there a difference between um, different types of inanimate objects? Obviously, we can see that a dog or an insect is some, some degree of conscious, but when we look at inanimate objects, I don't know, for example, my toilet, is that oh, conscious petting. in the same way the sun is conscious? I mean, you know, what's no, the difference there? But, but it's, when I say everything is infused with consciousness, um, we know that matter is... 99.99% .99 empty space. So you're holding a rock in your hand, and 99.9% .9 of that, is, even more than that, is empty space. And you've got, you know, if you've got the nucleus here, the, uh, in, the electrons spinning around are hundreds of yards away. Um, so why is it iron? Or why is it water? Um, And I, I just suggest that consciousness has something to do with that, but the, the electromagnetic force is the key factor here. And this is where, where the writing about the sun and celestial beings led me. 
um, through various stages to recognize this, that light is the ultimate force consciousness of the universe. It's the thing that in, infuses the entire universe with consciousness. And if you look at the electromagnetic spectrum, visible light is just a tiny bit of it, as we know. And you've got gamma rays at one end and long wave radio at the other end. And all of them are invisible. I mean, we call visible light visible because it makes things visible to us. But you can't actually see the light in between. It's, 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 it's itself invisible. And that's the main product of all, our, all the stars out there is light. And it was even in Christianity, it was one of the first things that God created. But if you go back to a couple of other religions, there's Akhenaten in Egypt and Zoroaster in Persia, Zoroastrianism recognized that light itself was a divinity, and they had no image of their god because you can't have an image of light. And many of their names and descriptions of light would fit in with how quantum theory describes light as being outside of time, the source of, the source of all energy, um, and in all of its wavelengths, it's, we, we do incredible things with light. We, we, we send radio signals and television signals, we do MRI scans, x-rays, um, we look, we get all the information through our eyes, through light, and we kind of think, oh, well, that's because we're so clever, we can do all these things with light. Light is just some accidental thing that comes out of stars that happen to, you know, happen to come into being. But if you go right back, this is my theory really, is that light was the originator of the universe. And light itself, when you travel at the speed of light, time stops to exist, ceases to exist, as you know. Um, if you go beyond it, you go backwards in time. But at the speed of light, there is no time. And light also is the vibration, unlike sound, which doesn't need to vibrate in anything. And it exists independent of that. So it doesn't need a place to be. So when, when a, if you're looking at the sun or you're looking at Sirius, um, the light from Sirius, I think it's about nine years and eight trillion miles in details though, um, before that photon reaches the back of your eyeball. But as far as the photon is concerned, it got there the instant it left, because time doesn't exist for it. And you talk about, well, how do you get through all those, all those kilometers, you know? What kilometer? What are you talking about? You know, I was there, and then I'm here. It doesn't even recognize space. So, in fact, when there was no, if there was a beginning to the universe, and you want to go back before that, energy could have existed, because it doesn't have to be in any place. And this is very hard for our it's heads a mind to, to concept, mind boggling sure. concept, but it doesn't need a place to be. And it is, as we know, that E equals mc squared, it is equivalent, with, has an equivalence with matter. So in that we can turn matter into light with an atomic bomb, we've never done the opposite, which is to turn light into matter, but that is the other side of the equation. So you could have had energy or light creating, you know, a big whoosh instead of a big bang, creating this universe. And if that did, then we see the first thing that came out of this raw matter, this hydrogen and helium, were bodies which created more light. So it was almost a reproductive thing. Okay, we'll put stuff in here that, that makes more light. And it's... Uh, as such, it is light, light exists inside, you know, it's the EM force that is holding, that is giving iron the, the, cat, this, the, the qualities of iron, and carbon the qualities of, of, of iron. So, to, to put this very simply, it sounds like you're saying light itself is God, yeah, uh, yeah. And, and it's the creator and, of all the... And Zoroaster, that was Zoroaster was <laughs> also said that, and Akhenaten, and when I was looking at particularly Zoroastrianism, it's, it's still around, it's the old, one of the oldest religions on the planet, 
um, a lot of its good ideas were thankfully lifted by, by the Christianity and the Abrahamic religions, but it was the first religion to see goodness as something to aspire to. You never had a God who was goodness. And, and light is something we always associate with that. You know, it's always the forces of light against the forces of darkness. And, you have, and you're inspired by light, and you see the light, and you shed light on things, and you go for enlightenment, and you're delighted. It's always associated with spiritual, uplifting, happy wisdom. So intelligence too, right? You so, intelligence, you know, bright, yeah. dazzling. And, you know, and so it's, in a sense, our linguistic body languages tells us about the nature of light itself, but we're so far removed from making that connection to it. And it's, uh, it's interesting also that Zoroastrianism was not intolerant of other religions. You know, it wasn't, you must do this because God says it. You know, it was, if you want to worship flying pigs, fine. You know, you can live in our community, we don't mind. Um, well. So, okay, we have, a, we have a conscious universe that is built on light, perhaps, let's yeah, say. Okay. Um, but within that we have physical matter, oh. and, and it seems that you're suggesting that that's all conscious too, which I guess goes back to animistic In, ideas. Infused with. I mean, I, I, have, I have trouble with that myself. Right. Um, I did once, um, I think it was very... In Goa, I have this, uh, this, this feeling that every grain of sand on the beach was doing its bit, you know, to to get up at the top layer and be polished. And you look at microscopic photos of sand, and they're all completely different. It's quite interesting stuff. Um, how I think that at the lowest level, that consciousness just manifests in the atomic shape and the qualities of the product uh, of the item. And when you get down to quantum mechanics, then you see or they see it in action, in the unpredictability of, of, of matter well, at it, that level. In, in, um, in indigenous uh, you know, animistic philosophies, we had, um, you know, they'd see a lake as conscious and a mountain as conscious, yeah. and certainly the air as conscious, the you know, water as conscious, yeah. and they, you know, they'd see that. Um, but right now, okay, so, we humans are conscious, you know, well, I'm conscious, you're conscious, yeah. we, have, uh, we have bacteria inside uh -huh. us that may be conscious. Um, so we have, <coughs> we have our own individual consciousnesses. And then there's been work by like Dean Radin, who actually has got, he's on the back yeah, of your book, yeah, isn't he? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, so uh, or was it Princeton University showing a kind uh -huh. of human collective consciousness? So, so I'm conscious and you're conscious and we also share a collective consciousness with everything. Now, when it comes to physical matter, where does it separate? So, so let's say the well, sand is conscious, is the beach conscious? How, how does that work? the mountain mm. um, or the ocean. Um, that consciousness of the mountain is made up of every single molecule that makes up that mountain. It conspires towards giving the mountain whatever character it has. And uh, you lived in Nepal for a couple of years. People describe different characters to different mountains. Um, and you get winds, certain winds have a character coming off Africa into the Mediterranean. And, um, and these are clearly made up, of, you know, the consciousness, if, you, if you're talking about a thundercloud or an ocean, you know, oceans have these sort of complex currents running through all the world's oceans, un underground separate currents and, and, and above ground and at the surface and below the surface. Um, whether it's the Gulf Stream is the one, is our local one, but you have them connecting all the continents. And how is the ocean organizing this? It's, it's the buildup of all the individual particles in there. And if they haven't got some sort of microscopic consciousness, you're not going to see it manifested in the weather system unless every water molecule is there. Like, like in our brains, you know, we've got hundreds of billions of neurons contributing to our consciousness. And if all of those were dead, we wouldn't have any consciousness if they were just inactive, remote things. Now, all the consciousness of a bench might be doing is making it a bench, and that's pretty low-level consciousness. Um, 
but it's it's going back to the Princeton principle. And you, you uh, I suppose it comes out of the the, unpredict the unpredictability of particles that has been discovered by quantum physics. I mean, that's the thing, you know, most people would disagree with this idea that the whole universe is conscious and they would say that inanimate objects are simply inanimate and there's nothing going on beyond the physical reaction of... And they'd say the same thing about trees, but now they've discovered the, the so the scientifically called wood wide web, where trees communicate with each other underground through a mycorrhizal fungi network. They help trees that are in need and they, they, they store up food, extra food and then they can send nutrition to an ailing tree. Plants send messages to each other, oh, there's predators coming, build up your defenses. I mean, we see this extraordinary level of consciousness in the plant and vegetable world now, which so that, is getting hard to deny. That, okay, so that, again, that's a, it's, it's, it, it, the leap from recognizing plants as conscious seems to be happening, but that's quite a big leap um, yeah. You know, from animals, we could see animals are conscious. Fine, we start to recognize that. Yeah. Now we're seeing trees are conscious. But to go from there to rocks and and well, crystals. Well, okay. Well, if if you go to intermediate, if you recognize a mountain as an entity, and and I don't know what it can do with its consciousness, or, or maybe it just creates a character. I don't know. Um, but if you, where do you draw the line? Where do you draw the line? between a mountain and really big rocks and, and stones and grains of sand. I mean, there's no... Same with, with animals. Where do you draw the line as you come down? To once they say, okay, cats and dogs, and there's going to be breeds of dogs, then it's going to be mice and rats, and then worms, and, you know, where do you, where do you say, no, these are conscious, these aren't? You can't really draw that line, and when you have if you look at weather systems, I mean, if you're looking at the particles of those, they're not inanimate. We call weather systems inanimate. We call mountains and rivers inanimate. Um, we call trees inanimate. And yet, you know, if you do a, if you did a time lapse of mountain ranges being formed over millions of years, it would probably be as eye-opening as when we see plants in time lapse and see them struggling and reaching for the sun and so forth who knows fair enough well okay so we have we can see you know the world around us uh, in this physical earth that we're on might be uh, animate in some ways even though it appears inanimate but you were talking before about um galaxies being you know on a, on a much larger scale consciousness manifesting in, you know on gigantic scale right. so, so in your book you talk about galaxies themselves having kind of personalities and characters and talking to each other and you know that well, kind of I don't, thing. I don't, I, I just put that forward as a, as a, I think it's a probability, I put it forward as a possibility. Um, first of all, every star has a note, a, a electromagnetic signal it sends out, uh, it's, it's, its signature if you like. So you can pick that up and it stays constant. As what, like sun, sun solar flares or what do you... No, no, it's just an, an electromagnetic uh, signal coming, you know, its actual note, if you like. Um, Radio or something. Yeah, you can, I mean, scientists recognize this. They've all got their own character. They don't call it character, obviously. Um, so you've got, you know, 100 billion plus stars in the Milky Way all sending out their signals, their note. The Milky Way has one coherent signal that it sends out as does every other galaxy. So it's just the same thing repeated on a different scale. I mean, human beings are all remarkably similar from the point of view of any other animal on the planet. Um, and we all have our kind of signal. Um, though possibly our group signal is a bit more of a cacophony than <laughs> a solid thing. And they, but they have also found the, the links between galaxies the um, magnetic portals that connect one galaxy to another because they can tell, they can spot them or the effect of them at a distance. They're in, invisible fields, obviously. So my supposition is that the whole galaxy is connected. I mean, all the stars are connected by these portals. And in the same way, you know, every neuron in our brain might have a hundred or a thousand 
other connections to other neurons. Um, and you know how those interact and create thought and manage the body is you know, still way beyond our understanding. But if these connections are found between stars within a galaxy as well as within galaxies, you have this connected network of entities um, with that in incredible capacity. You know, what they do with that, I, I can't tell you. I mean, we think you have, to, you have to build machines with consciousness, but there's all sorts of other things you can do with it. So it seems to be in the, in the book that you are suggesting that galaxies themselves are a kind of fractal expansion of the human brain and that, you know, we have all these little neurons that are, that are firing oh, off and talking yeah. to each other and we have this grand consciousness that we use to communicate to other things and it seems to be suggesting that, that you know, stars form a similar function to neurons in our brains and, and these grand galaxies are, you know... I think that's, I think that's a, a strong possibility. I mean, there's no way to really prove that, but if they do start to find that stars are connected, if they're able to have the technology to detect that, which is difficult, um, but if they are connected, then that's almost certainly what's going on. I suspect they are, and whether there are magnetic portals or not, if the I mean, they're all sending electromagnetic signals out constantly. And we, we tend to think that solar flares and coronal mass ejections are all just like, you know, we pass wind on undigested food, just these random occurrences on the sun. Now, they have got satellites on all sides of the sun. They've got satellites orbiting the sun that, that the orbit goes out past Earth and Mars and comes back again. And... They have found now that the, the, the coronal filaments, the solar flares, coronal mass ejections, they're all, in sunspots, they're all coordinated. They're not just random. They're all on all sides of the sun. They're connected. That activity is synchronized somehow. Um, and we just dismiss it as you know, random emanations. But who knows what, what messages, what's going on. I mean, it's massive displays of, of energy and you know, perhaps it's a purpose, perhaps it's not accidental. When we do stuff like that, there's always a purpose to it. You suspect that perhaps the sun is talking to another sun using solar flares or sending something? Messages, sending messages out um, with the corona mass. Who, who knows? Um, I mean, a, a sort of out there physicist friend of mine, um, you know, suggests that we might, you know, we might be one of the most popular uh, reality TV shows in the galaxy. <laughs> you know, look at planet, look what I got here, mate. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, one of the ideas I really liked in your book was this idea of, of galaxies themselves being conscious and using, um, you know, suns being neurons, but like they're using light to instantly communicate with each other across. across well, it's, yeah, again, this is a hard thing for us to get our head around because, you know, the light that's reaching us now, we've aged eight minutes while it comes, but it, it arrives, you know, the photon is exactly the same. It can travel trillions of miles through space, and that photon has not lost any energy en route or spent any time getting there. So, in a sense, you know, all those lights, they're all connected on a... I, I don't know, I can't get my head around how that means for, for stars communicating with each other, but I do believe that the sun which makes everything visible. It gives us the light that we can see with. I believe the sun sees itself. You know, it's able to use light in the same way that we can. Every single animal on earth has developed eyes. And if the light, the light hitting earth bounces back, if it's a giant torch, I shine a torch in the darkness, I can see the picture of what's there because as we understand it mechanically, the light is bouncing back and bringing that image is not dazzled by the outgoing light. So if the sun, you know, the sun light bounces back, we call it, to the sun, it's got a lens the size of the sun. So it's gonna be able to see insanely good detail of, you know, however it might, might want to interpret that or whatever it's able to interpret. Um, 
so star to star, they may be, you know, like people in a room, <laughs> um, aware of each other's presence and seeing each other. Who knows? It's a... I, I like one of the things you're talking about in the book also about how, you know, with light being intelligent, yeah. you're saying that light is able to convey just vast amounts of information. Yeah. You know, with this, with this, all of these light photons coming down from the sun onto you, about just one bounces off you and, you know, goes directly towards me. Yeah. And, you know, that, that little scatter of the millions that are showered on you, the scatter that I see then carries just all of this information. I can see your face and who you are yeah, and yeah, you know, yeah, your personality. Yeah. And well, I mean, I've gone beyond that actually since I wrote the book because I've since then discovered that um, Plato had the, he saw light as a, a twin function because the lights come, because he saw the light coming out of our eyes. Which, which it does. I mean, that's what they call the light of life. And when you're dead, then there's no light coming out of your eyes anymore. And he saw that as combining with the light from the sun or other sources to then bring us into the world. And I've, I've thought about this a lot. And this is not solely a picture at the back of my eyeballs. I mean, I'm looking at the sky, a house, you, flowers, cameras, and it's because the light's coming out of my eyes, conjoining with that, it's bringing me into the picture. So I'm here, I'm, I'm with all this stuff. It's not just a picture at the back of my eyeball. And that's, that's a really clear sensation. Now to, to fool us into doing that otherwise has taken some incredibly high tech, um, virtual reality technology and you can fool yourself into thinking that but it's you know here you really are there with no technology doing it other than the light coming in and out of our eyes and that plato's theory held for about 1500 years and and eventually it was um you know i don't know why they let go of it and just because light does come out of our eyes and it's so that's that's I and mean, so I, I don't really see the uh, it is as a mechanical as the light bounces off and all the green everything but green stays with the leaf and the green comes to my eyes it's like bringing us into the picture and making us part of it and yeah i was going to say informing us of the world around us but it's not it's making us part of that world so we were talking before about, uh, you know, uh, the solar flares and the stars communicating with each yeah. other. Um, one thing that caught my eye over the last few years was, was this idea of a kind of, um, it was Major Ed Dames, you know him? He's a remote viewer guy and he was talking about the kill shot. You heard about this? The kill shot. The kill shot. And it was kill this shot. idea of this grand solar flare that was going to knock us back to the, you know, the, you know, zeroth century whatever or, or before um and and uh you know potentially that's the coronal mass ejection you're talking about yeah. okay yes right and 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 right now we can see that we're on a planet and we're screwing up the planet pretty badly yeah. and and there's a kind of anxiety among a lot of people that the ecosystem is going to break down and and you know human civilization is no longer going to be able to support ourselves maybe m the earth will have something to do with that and you know as george carlin says you know shake us off like a bad case of the fleas so you know m m there's this kind of slight anxiety that maybe the sun could kill us all one day and and uh you know <laughs> my my question to you is let's say let's say the sun is conscious and we're saying hello to the sun do you think the sun likes us do you think the sun wants us to be here or do you think it it would uh, happily conspire in our demise what, what do you think um i have thought about that i don't know what i think really um i do think that there's enough people on this planet who really love being here and enjoy the pleasures of the planet. I mean, they're not all looking at their phones when they're getting that way. Um, I think we're honoring our existence by and large. I mean, everything we read about is wars and politics and Brexit and poverty. I mean, we're sort of focused on all the news is, is what's bad seems to be what, what sells. But people are good. Uh, so the coronal mass ejection is 
Yeah, there was one. Is I think it's 1858, the Harrington, Carrington event, and um, and it was gorgeous. People went out and stared at the skies. This is amazing how beautiful it is. You know, nobody got headaches or sickness or burned or anything by it. Telegraph cables you know, caught fire, and that was that was because it was channeling that energy. But it was actually a beautiful energy just for people to enjoy. And today, of course, it would melt down a lot of our power systems and technology and you know, electronic systems and cars would, would melt down. So if one of those happened, it would be a serious body blow. It's not going to affect the whole Earth because these things pass through over a period of hours and the Earth is not rotating fast enough for it to hit the old earth. So, so some, some lucky countries would be completely unscathed oh, fuck you. <laughs> and be the new rulers of the world. Um, so yeah, I, don't, I mean, that's a, it's a sobering thought, but I've lived in a, when I had my house in Goa, we had no, no power, no, hardly any power, and no running. You know, we had none of those mod cons, and life was great. I mean, it was, and you never had to, Put things in the wall and charge them, and, one, and call up people to get things fixed. Um, but I love all the technology and all the mud cons, but they're not essentials to life. They're essentials to maybe banking and governments and so you we, know we certain could, things we're used to. But so if the sun uh, if the sun knocked us back in that way, it might actually be a good thing for humanity on the long term in, in some way. I don't know if it'd be a good thing or not, but I think we would survive it. So, so I mean, going back to that question, though, do you think the sun likes us? Do you, do you think, do you think, uh, you know, that uh, when we have a relationship with the sun, there's there's a goodness going back and forth, and it and it kind of loves us in some way. Do you, do you does, it, does it love us, like us, or is it crying, or is it angry? I don't know. <laughs> it's not on Facebook. I can't tell. <laughs> yeah, okay. um, I love the sun, the sun loves me, it supplies me, you know, but it loves me, it loves this, it loves the sunflower, it loves, you know, the tree. It's, it's, it's infusing all of, us, all of us with life, it's non-denominational. Um, I don't think it really gives a damn what we eat or how we trim our facial hair. It's, it's how we behave, how we respect life. Um, and that's all up to us. It's whether the sun likes us or not, is, uh, it enables us to do whatever we want to do. Yeah, I'm, I'm very much interested in having a deeper relationship with the sun and I recognize after having read your book that I've basically ignored it my entire life yeah. and, 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 you know, having read your book, I'm still not quite sure what to do. Like, I, you know, I, I, I'll go on a walk with my dog and I'll look at the sun and go, hey sun, but I don't know where to take it further from that, you know, and, uh, and, and I, I recognize that there's probably a deep relationship to be had there, but I don't know how to create it or nurture it. So, do you have any advice on that? Sun gazing. And there's, if you're not squinting and, you know, and, and it's on the horizon, I mean, you don't get many sunsets, well, maybe in Bristol you do, or wherever you live, but um, I, don't, I don't get sunsets or sunrises, you have to travel for them. But that's when it's, it's very, very easy for anybody to do. And it's, it's only, you know, as, as the sun rises, there'll be a point where you're, you're squinting to look at it, and that's when you stop. But you're not going to have damaged yourself by it. I mean, if you're, I mean, even when I did my first sun gazing, it was 20 minutes, so I didn't damage myself. But, but those conditions were appropriate for sun gazing at the time. But it obviously gives you something back, otherwise you wouldn't keep doing it. Yeah, it just it it. It's like what you get out of music, a beautiful tune that you it lights it lights me up, it energizes me. Um, and then there's, I read just, I was researching the articles on sunblock and the dangers of it. Um, I realized that all the other things it does for me on a non-psychological you know, level, just on the, on the overall good health and happiness and freedom from degenerative diseases, which is, which is pretty good as well. And I think some of that's from the sun casing. It does more than because not just the vitamin D, that's the other thing they found out in their research. There's other factors there that they don't know what they are. 
and probably more to be discovered as well. No, the feel good factor, and I don't know how they can measure that, but it's, it, it's, it's good to feel good and to get uplifted by something like that. It, it manifests on all sorts of levels. Well, you know, w w with uh, recognize it as, uh, recognizing the sun as intelligent when we, when we try and open this communication, whether it's with sun gazing or just hanging yeah. out the sun or whatever, um, it, it's a little difficult for people from our culture to do that because, you know, we, I think we're quite limited by ideas of what, how intelligence can manifest. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, maybe things are changing now, uh, you know, with slime molds. Uh, yeah. I don't know if you've yeah. seen that thing with I know, the talking I know. subway <laughs> and that kind of thing. So, um, one thing that your, your book talked about that was really interesting was um, about how microbes themselves uh, have character. Um, some guy, some scientist, you talk about this. In Australia, yeah. Yeah, what, what uh, was that? So it was a, it was a single-celled rotifers, which are just slightly above single-celled pond scum type of stuff and um, yeah he, he developed a little microscope where he could sort of track them in a small space and he would see some would some would have different tastes some would go for the um, the algae green algae and you could see that green in their stomachs and some would be eating other stuff and they wouldn't have any green in their stomachs and they're all the and same actually, species I, pardon they're all the same species well, the same species a little these tiny rotifers and I, I I remember this from a, um, a friend's uh, tea party that I'd had this, had this chat about this. And I contacted him, I managed to track the guy down just to verify it. And he said, oh, you'll also be interested to know I did a trial with, with laboratory bred genetically identical rats. And for some reason this trial involved Mars bars. And some of the rats wouldn't eat the Mars bars and others would, others would devour them. Which, you know, so at a, at a higher level, maybe it's less surprising there, but yeah. Um, so, that, so all of these things do display individual tastes and individual characters yeah, and individual yeah. consciousness. It's very hard to look at that and see it as an in, intelligent in some way, um, due, due mainly to our cultural filters. I, I read this quote by this guy, Robert Briolt. He says, um, if a rabbit defined intelligence the way man does, then the most intelligent animal would be the rabbit, followed by the animal most willing to obey the commands of the rabbit. And, and you know, we, we have very limited idea of what intelligence is and how it can manifest. So when we look at the sun, it's, it's still, it, you know, for, for most people, it's quite hard to, yeah, to get no, over I, that. I realize that. That's why, that's why I had to write the book, because having had this awareness for you know, 30 years, 30 odd years before I wrote the book, uh, I would only bring it up when people would talk about SETI's search for extraterrestrial intelligence. And we're sending CDs up into space and God knows what, to, and, and listening for radio signals. And I, I, would, I would say, well, this is the most intelligent thing in our whole galaxy, in our whole solar system. We're completely ignoring, you know, the sun and, you know, sending out, looking for intelligent life out there. And, and, but I, and never, people never got it. People just look at me like I was a, a madman. Well, that's the thing. So, so it's considered a, a mad view to to be considering the sun as intelligent. Mm. So, so you know everything that you've told me and everything in your book, and, and there's so much more out there, um, points to the sun actually being intelligent. However, uh, you know that's a very fringe view. Uh, is there anything for a kind of you know a hardcore atheistic kind of very you know orthodox science based well, person? To, that well, can change their mind about well, that? Well, the first, the first thing is to, is to recognize that as opposed to all the religions out there, the sun is not a delusion. It's there. It is bringing us the light of life. And there's no denying that. So you can take it from, you know, you can look at it from there with, a, with an open mind and a scientific mind. And as, as I said, what astounded me was that so much of the science, or let's say, let's say none of the science contradicted it, and a lot of the science underlined it when I was writing the book. And it's, uh, it is an unusual, you know, it's, it's a, how do you describe it? Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's not in our mindset at all, the idea of stars being celestial beings. But my father gave me advice from a very young age. He said, always keep off the beaten track. And I have. And in 1967, when my brother and I were introducing people to this brand new idea that what you ate affected your health and selling natural foods and selling first organically grown foods as well 
people looked at us like we were completely nuts. It was a completely alien concept to think that food affected health. And today, for many people, what could be more obvious than that what you eat affects your health? But then nutritionists didn't even accept that. As long as you had the right level of protein, fats, and carbohydrates, it didn't matter whether it came from Mars bars and chips or from organic, you know, rice and broccoli, um, you were going to be okay. And that was, uh, so that was a, a crazy idea that we were putting out there. And, um, but one that has some history and does make sense. And as I say, the concept of a conscious sun is not new. It's as old as the hills. And was once held sway wherever you went, whether you were in, you know, Mongolia or you know, the, the Celts, the, you know, all the Native Americans and the, the Egyptians, the Maya, the Cambodians. You know, everywhere you went in the world, people recognized the bringer of life as a living entity itself and one with divine status. So I'm just, I might be one of the only, um, so, you know, what do they call them, sun priest or something in the world today, but, but they used to be one of the most coveted jobs on the planet. Well, you know, you were talking about the trees before and they were not considered conscious and now we're understanding that they are and they share nutrients and they share information. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you think science is going to catch up with this about the sun? Oh, eventually, I think it's inevitable. I mean, at the moment, they're just suffering from a Christian taboo and this headset of Descartes that is, I think, therefore I am. And on that was the assumption that dogs don't think. And, but it's experiencing. If you know who you are, and you're experiencing life. Um, where does thinking come into? I mean, in a, in a pure state of meditation, you try to avoid thinking at all costs because it, it messes it up. Well, so, you know, finally we're, we're <clears throat> we're on this uh, this planet in this human civilization that's um, that's really fucking things up. You know, we're we're on a society mm -hmm. which is rapacious greed. The Amazon is burning right now. It's yeah, yeah. dominating the news. So with this with this uh, screwed up world we're in, you know, how can we how can we change this? How does how does uh, honoring the sun and honoring the the consciousness in reality change things? And how do we how do we get into that position where we can start? Um, caring about the world again because it seems that we've completely lost that and we're fucked yeah. if we don't change. So, well, so think, yeah. how do we get back there? I think the most important thing, and, and many people have done this, is recognizing our total connection with the world. The sun is a huge part of that because it wouldn't be a world without the sun. So that's a major point in it but also just recognizing that we're sharing this world with all the other beings and elements on it, whether it's the mountains or the trees um, or other people and animals. And getting away from that imprint in our culture that was laid down in Genesis that God put all this here specifically for humanity in this giant universe that it was all done just, just for us to, to view as our infinite store cupboard and infinite garbage pit. And that is, that's very much came with the Abrahamic religions. People used to go out and, you know, worship the trees and have ceremonies in Greece and, and respect animals and, you know, give blessings when they killed an animal and, and, and ate it and not just sort of slaughter them in slaughterhouses. There used to be that connection with the world. And that's, there are people all over the planet who, have, who are being motivated by that with organizations, with companies, you know, with lifestyle changes. And that needs to happen on a much larger scale. And I suppose that I'm going with, with, with my book, Son of God, I'm going for the, you know, a high level of connection to be connected with that which makes everything else we need to be connected with alive and in existence because that's where we get matter from that's where we get light and the light of life from so that's and that connection i believe is going to make us much more 
much more able to behave in a way that will sustain all of this rather than just this endless growth that we're supposed to have more things more stuff where we, we, we've got we've got everything we need in this world and we don't need to um, I won't even talk about wars and stuff like that but we don't really need to destroy it in order to enjoy it it's, a, it's the greatest oxymoron on the planet thank you Greg thank you very much your book if you if you uh, show my book I'm holding it up is um, absolutely fantastic I recommend let me just zoom in on that here we go son of God everybody uh, who is listening I suggest you give this a read it is, uh, it is excellent and and uh, I think really this this way of thinking um, that you espouse in the book of, of uh, you know recognizing that the universe is conscious mm -hmm. is is um, an extremely important step in our evolution of, as, of humanity to yeah. to get past this really screwed up dark period mm -hmm. that we're in right now where we're just destroying everything yeah. and and I think if we can start recognizing the, the you know because so we are amazing, but we are not the most amazing thing in the entire universe. <laughs> I mean, that's the arrogance. There we go, indeed. All right, thank you, Greg. Appreciate okay. it. Okay, <laughs> thank you.